Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula. And when I'm not drinking Fresca, my only weakness, I'm here at Castle Wolfula reviewing movies. Universal Horror Month has reached its conclusion this year, and you might be asking, where's the Invisible Man? And I say to you, he's the Invisible Man. Of course he's nowhere to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> In this video, I'll be covering a different James Whale film, and probably the greatest of his filmography, and arguably the greatest of all of Universal's monster films, The Bride of Frankenstein, released in 1935 and starring Karloff as the husband of Frankenstein. Frank? A sequel to Frankenstein was considered before the original movie was even released due to strong reactions from audiences previewing the film. Universal even had James Whale change Frankenstein's ending before its wider release, adding a coda where it's revealed that Henry Frankenstein somehow survived being thrown off a windmill, smacking a blade on the way down, leaving the door open for the doctor to continue his dark work. Here's to a son, to the house of Frankenstein. James Whale, the first film's director, wasn't interested in a sequel to Frankenstein, though, and Universal pursued other directors to try to take over, but producer Carl Emley Jr. couldn't find anybody that was a match to James Whale, so Whale, like usual, used being in demand for a horror picture as leverage to request directing another movie first, One More River, a major film at the time that is virtually completely forgotten compared to Whale's horror movies today. I'm sleepy. So James Whale signed on to direct, but he still wasn't convinced he could make a sequel as good as the original Frankenstein. So Whale chose to instead make a film wilder than the original, pushing the boundaries of what he could get away with. To a new world of gods and monsters. <laughs> James Whale wasn't happy with any of the scripts he was submitted for the Frankenstein sequel, though. One of the scripts was literally titled The New Adventures of Frankenstein, The Monster Lives, which sounds like the name of a Saturday morning cartoon show, so John Balderston of Dracula and Mummy fame wrote his own take on a Frankenstein sequel that would reimagine a segment from the original Mary Shelley novel never before adapted for film. In the novel, the monster coerces his creator into crafting an undead bride for the monster, but Frankenstein has second thoughts about it, fearing that the two monsters will breed a race of beings that could destroy the human race. So the Bride of Frankenstein is teased in the novel, but never actually materialized as a character, making it ideal as the premise for the sequel, Frankenstein making a mate for his monster, and the screenplay was ultimately finalized by playwright William Hurlbut. She's alive! Alive! Bride of Frankenstein is widely considered the best of Universal's monster movies, and one of the greatest sequels of all time. Perhaps the first example of a truly great sequel. But does it hold up today? Of course, it's a masterpiece, but I'll explain why Bride of Frankenstein is so fantastic in my review of, well, Bride of Frankenstein. But first, I have a message from my sponsor, me. Pledge to my Patreon today to support the channel, help it continue to grow, and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday and archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. Pledge to patreon.com slash drwolfula if you're interested, and I thank you in advance. How beautifully dramatic! Bride of Frankenstein handles its recap of the first film in a clever way. Instead of just showing a bunch of quick and dirty clips from the first flick summarizing the plot, the sequel finally pays tribute to the author of the original novel, Mary Shelley, in its opening. What am I, Mary? She is an angel. You think so? Not only does Mary Shelley get an actual named credit in the title sequence, none of that Mrs. Percy B. Shelley bullshit, but Mary Shelley gets to be an actual character too, recreating the circumstances that surrounded her crafting the story of the original Frankenstein novel, accompanied on a dark and stormy night by her husband Percy and their fuck buddy Lord Byron. But I cannot flatter myself to that extent. Essentially, in this opening, James Whale not only wanted to finally put a spotlight on the creator of Frankenstein, but to also make a point that some of the most horrifying creations are dreamt up by beautiful people. Can you believe that bland and lovely brow conceived of Frankenstein? And I gotta say, Whale chose well casting Elsa Lanchester. There's something about a gap tooth and a chin dimple that really turns a guy on. Hot, 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 hot. <laughs> Whale also specifically wanted Elsa Lanchester to play the dual role of Mary Shelley and the titular Bride of Frankenstein. 
So I guess it's safe to say that Mary Shelley is not only the mother of science fiction, but she also created the very first self-insert. Why shouldn't I write of monsters? Basically, though, this sequence is just a recap of the first movie. You know, Henry makes a monster, monster gets loose, mob corners them both in a mill, and the mill burns down with the monster inside. Cut and dry. Imagine yourself standing by the wreckage of the mill. After the mill burned down, Hans, the father of the drowned girl Maria from the previous film, who was originally named Ludwig and was played by a totally different guy, refuses to believe the monster is dead until he sees a corpse. I can see his blackened bones. I can sleep at night. But upon investigating the mill's flooded basement, the only corpse Hans finds is his drowned one. Now he knows how his daughter feels. I'll get into this more later, but Bride of Frankenstein was heavily censored before release. So as you can tell here, to try to get around censoring these murders, they just cut to stock footage of a random owl like this is Twin Peaks. I don't know what an owl is doing near a burned mill in the middle of a barren field, but he's there to see everything going on. The one straggler at the mill who was spared is Minnie, played by Una O'Connor, reprising basically the same role she had in Invisible Man. <laughs> who has some extreme overreactions to things. <laughs> this is the first tip-off that Bride of Frankenstein doesn't take itself seriously. James Whale is fully embracing his campy sensibilities, making a horror comedy by poking fun at the monster films Universal was making. Minnie the Maid actually works at Castle Frankenstein, but nobody takes her claims that the monster still lives seriously because, well, she's a crazy bitch. Nobody believe me. I'll wash my hands of it. Let them all be murdered in the beds. Bride of Frankenstein kind of retcons the ending of the original movie, where it ended on a happy, hopeful note where Henry has quickly recovered from his encounter with the monster. Tell me. Oh, my lady, how can we tell you? In the sequel, Henry arrives to his castle seemingly dead until it's revealed that he just barely survived. <laughs> Another retcon is that Henry's newlywed wife, Elizabeth Frankenstein, was recast. Originally played by Mae Clark, played in the sequel by the much younger Valerie Hobson, who was 17 at the time shooting this movie. They should call this flick the Bride of Epstein. But in all seriousness, Valerie Hobson worked better in the role of Elizabeth compared to Clark. Hobson just has more of a presence on screen and really sells this sense of tragic devotion to her husband. Might even have found the secret of eternal life. Henry, don't say those things. It's blasphemous and wicked. Colin Clive, who again plays Henry Frankenstein, was strongly considered to be recast by Universal because Clive was an alcoholic and often worked while intoxicated, making him difficult to work with. But James Whale pushed for his friend to return to the role of Frankenstein, and Clive's performance as Henry in this film is some of his best work as an even more tortured and broken man. A role that Colin Clive played in real life all too well, dying two years after Bride of Frankenstein premiered at the age of 37. There are always accidental deaths occurring. Always. Henry's more than happy to give up his work as a god wannabe, but every time Henry thinks he's out, they pull him back in. On a secret matter of grave importance. They, being a former mentor of Henry's by the name of Dr. Pretorius, played by Ernest Thessinger, an old friend of James Wales from the director's theater days. Pretorius supposedly conceived specifically with Thessinger in mind. Universal wanted Claude Rains in the role of Pretorius, but Whale made the right choice casting Thessinger, who brought a certain sensibility to the character that made him particularly unique for the time. What do you want? We must work together. Never. Essentially, Pretorius is a subversion of Dr. Waldman's boring character from the original movie, who disapproved of Henry's experiments, acting as the angel on Henry's shoulder that the younger doctor would ignore. You have created a monster and it will destroy you. Patience, patience. Pretorius, on the other hand, is the devil on Henry's shoulder, who not only encouraged the young scientist to pursue his blasphemous work, but Pretorius pursued it himself, returning to his pupil at the worst possible time, Henry's honeymoon, to show Frankenstein the weird shit he's been making. You must see my creation. Have you also succeeded in bringing life to the dead? 
Pretorius, in his spare time, has been creating life very different from the reanimated corpses Henry had been toying with. Pretorius's creations are homunculi, and I can hear the anime nerd's ears perking up. And no, these homunculi aren't sexy goths. They're the actually accurate depiction of homunculi, tiny artificially created human beings. And Pretorius dressed them up like little dollies. I must wake him up. <laughs> The effects to bring the homunculi to life hold up really well, but it's really just a matte effect. They shot the actors in large-scale jars and just composited their image in post-production over these small jars that were actually on the set. You won't dance to anything but Mendelssohn's spring song, and it gets so monotonous. The homunculi do veer drastically into the realm of fantasy as opposed to science fiction, but they illustrate the difference between Pretorius and Frankenstein. Henry seeks to bring about new life through scientific means, while Pretorius aims to get results by any means necessary, no matter how weird or unorthodox, turning his back on science at this stage in his life. This isn't science. It's more like black magic. Pretorius's character acts as the main antagonist of Bride of Frankenstein. He shows how far Frankenstein could go if he continues down the path he's been on. No longer as master and pupil, but as fellow scientists. But Pretorius also acts as the Mephistopheles to Frankenstein's Faust, trying to push Henry back into his work of bringing the dead back to life. And at this point, Pretorius is a man who will do whatever needs to be done to get what he wants. There are penalties to pay for killing people. Are you threatening me? Pretorius is a fascinating character, maybe the absolute highlight of Bride of Frankenstein for me. Thesiger brings a charm and a sense of humor to the mad scientist archetype. Friend, yes, I hope so. Have a cigar. They're my only weakness. He's a villain that forces Frankenstein and others to perform crimes against humanity, but he's just so likable while being evil. Mercy on us. You want me to send you to the gallows where you belong? The other aspect of Pretorius is, well, he's gay. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's not overt, of course, but come on, no way this guy is straight. My first experiment was so lovely that we made her a queen. James Whale, who himself was openly gay, supposedly told Thesiger to play the character as an aging, bitchy queen. There's a certain resemblance to me, don't you think? Or do I flatter myself? This brings with it the idea that Pretorius seeks to create life his own way, because he can't do it the natural way. I mean, he could do it the natural way, but he'd have to be concentrating really hard on thinking about guys. Be fruitful and multiply. While Pretorius is trying to force Frankenstein to ironically build a lady monster... A woman. That should be really interesting. The OG monster is off going on adventures of his own. The running theme is that wherever the monster goes, he's more than unwelcome, even when he's trying to help. The monster tries to be friendly, but his appearance and reputation only results in more pain for him. He's treated like a monster based on his appearance, so he becomes monstrous in return. The ultimate goal of the monster in Bride of Frankenstein is to find a place to belong with someone, companionship. The tragedy of the monster, though, is that he can't belong anywhere. He shouldn't exist to begin with. I love dead, hate living. You're wise in your generation. The film plays heavily with Christian iconography, especially when the angry mob hoists the monster up on a pole as if crucifying him. Essentially, the monster is a Christ-like figure whose god is human, and consequently the monster is extremely flawed, lacking the divine spark of the messiah he becomes a parody of. It's blasphemous and wicked. The film originally had much more blasphemous moments in it before it was censored. <laughs> The monster was supposed to knock over a statue of Jesus on the cross, thinking it was a real person crucified, trying to rescue him. But instead, the monster just knocks over a statue of a bishop. Pretorius was originally supposed to refer to belief in God as fairy tale stories, but instead he just snidely says Bible stories. Follow the lead of nature, or of God, if you like your Bible stories. What made it into the film is still blasphemous, but it's not overtly blasphemous, so it could get past senses. Now I know what it feels like to be God! The monster can't be caged, and he can't be killed, so he has to exist whether he wants to or not. But he manages to find the one place where he belongs, the home of a blind hermit who is as kind as he is gifted at playing the violin, the music soothing the creature. No one will hurt you here. Huh? <sighs> If you're in trouble, perhaps I can help you. 
The hermit offers the monster a home, welcoming the creature with open arms. The hermit doesn't care who the monster is, he just wants a companion the same as the monster, and the monster experiences for the first time sustained comfort, happiness, and love. It's fleeting, but it's the one time something good happens for the monster that isn't immediately ruined. Hast brought two of thy lonely children together, and sent me a friend. Spending time with the hermit, though, results in the monster learning how to speak. Right. <sighs> which was a controversial aspect of the film during production, especially for Karloff. Boris Karloff felt that making the monster speak would rob the character of his charm as a simple-minded, inarticulate being. Friends. <laughs> <laughs> the monster does learn how to talk in the Mary Shelley novel, and in the book he's not only articulate, he never shuts the fuck up. James Whale's approach to the monster speaking was to more believably limit the creature to the vocabulary of a small child during his stay with the hermit, eating bread and smoking rafer. Good, good. Speaking is just a natural progression of the monster's character, and Karloff's approach to it is just as memorable as Bela Lugosi's accent playing Dracula. Fire. No good. No. Speaking of natural progression, Jack Pierce, of course, returned to apply the monster's makeup, and it's essentially the same, but just a little shaggier. The monster's hair has been scorched almost completely off, his coat is burned, he's more scarred, and it seems like he's decayed a bit. The small added details make the monster look more natural as this broken figure, somebody that has experienced a lot of hardships since the events of the first movie. And the hardships only continue once some hunters find the monster shacking up with the hermit. This is the fiend that's been murdering half the countryside. Good heavens, man, can't you see? Oh. And the brief, happy life the two had together comes tumbling down in a fiery blaze. <laughs> but the monster quickly finds another kindly old man to be friends with in the form of Dr. Pretorius, the only man who can look at the monster without sudden fear, because Pretorius has seen shit a lot scarier. I think you can be very useful. And you will add a little force to the argument, if necessary. And through his companionship with the monster, Pretorius finally has a way to get Frankenstein to cooperate. And the monster finally gets to tell his creator to sit the fuck down. Sit down. The monster is his own man, though, and acts on his own, kidnapping Elizabeth to show Frankenstein he means business, forcing Frankenstein no choice but to make the monster a mate. But if you can bring her back, I'll do anything that you want. With the two storylines finally joined, the plot becomes a lot more straightforward, essentially a recreation of the first half of the original film, where Frankenstein was trying to build his first monster, but done in the sequel on a much grander scale, with much more elaborate electrical equipment supplied again by Kenneth Strickfadden. James Whale's approach going into the sequel was clearly, well, if I'm gonna do this shit again, I might as well do it better. But once upon a time, we should have been burnt at the stake as wizards for this experiment. The process of building the bride is even darker and more unhinged compared to creating the original monster. The first time, Frankenstein had a somewhat ethical approach, only stealing from the corpses of men who were already dead. But making a woman is a more delicate process, and Frankenstein needs fresher parts to work with. What we need is a female victim of sudden death. Can you do it? You promised me a thousand crowns. Dwight Fry returns from the original film, playing a totally different non-hunchback assistant named Carl. And Carl is a wanted murderer, forced to work for Pretorius. And when young lady body parts are needed, Carl gets them the only way he knows how. It's a very fresh one. Where did you get it? Supposedly, Bride of Frankenstein featured a lot more murders by Carl that were cut out and long lost. Dwight Fry also played a couple of other cut characters, one of whom was named Nephew Glutz, who murders his uncle and blames it on the monster, considered way too dark by censors. I wouldn't be surprised that the dead little girl we're shown in the movie wasn't killed by the monster either, but censors probably felt it would be easier for audiences to accept a monster killing a little girl and not a villager. What you say, pal? We give ourselves up and let them hang us. This is no life for murderers. Before moving on to the finale, I do have to highlight the score of Bride of Frankenstein composed by Franz Waxman, this being his first American film score, bringing to the movie's soundscape a European sensibility that complements the mood, atmosphere, and gothic set design, giving unique themes to three of the film's key characters, Pretorius, the monster, and his bride. The 
The score is unique for its time, really in tune with James Whale's style, not just enhancing the dramatic or scary sequences, but also accentuating the film's more whimsical or comedic moments, while still always sounding like music that only belongs in a horror film. Ultimately, after some fun with kites and the monster killing Dwight Fry again for laughs, <laughs> The Bride is successfully brought to life with literally only four minutes left in the movie, but what a four minutes she gets! The Bride of Frankenstein. The Bride, played by Elsa Lanchester, is a much more refined second draft of the idea of an undead creature. Instead of a deformed brain, she possesses an artificially engineered brain, and is far more stable in her behavior. Except, of course, even with no frame of reference, the bride finds her intended to be utterly repugnant on sight. <coughs> the Bride of Frankenstein had virtually no source material to base her appearance on, giving Jack Pierce even more freedom compared to making the original monster. So the approach he took with the bride's makeup was to make her beautiful, but still strange looking. So in addition to the expected stitching, the bride was given a big beehive hairdo made to resemble Queen Nefertiti's crown with lightning bolt streaks on the sides. That hair by itself sells the bride's design, which is otherwise this stark white figure clad in a gown. It's just as iconic as the Karloff monster's design, and the Bride of Frankenstein has become the first iconic female movie monster despite her incredibly short-lived appearance in what's basically her only movie. She hates me. Like Ultimately, the monster is rejected by his bride and isn't willing to enter couples therapy, but is very willing to pull the castle's magic self-destruction lever. But the monster allows his creator to flee with his bride Elizabeth. You'll stay. We belong dead. While Pretorius and the two monsters die in the blast. Admittedly, a very rushed ending. It maybe would have been nice to spend a little bit more time with the bride, but I can understand Whale not wanting to labor the point of the film. It's about the monster seeking companionship in varying ways, only to be met by failure each time, eventually quickly accepting his tragic fate after the one being created specifically for him rejects him. The only place where the monster belongs is with the dead. Bride of Frankenstein is the ultimate universal monster movie. It has everything. Action, murder, humor, tragedy, atmosphere, stunning visual and makeup effects. There's never a dull moment. Good, good. It all just comes together in the end to make a near perfect horror movie. The last great monster movie before the Lemleys lost control of Universal Pictures and James Whale's final horror movie ever. His finest entry in the genre. Bride of Frankenstein is an essential film for any horror fan to watch, and it and its predecessor are both the best entry points in the Universal's classic era of horror. I give Bride of Frankenstein a bride out of Frankenstein. This is no life for murderers. The air itself is filled with monsters. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.